Today we're going to prove that this pair of numbers that we're having a look at here uh, are both irrational. Now, before we have a go at this proof, I think it's really important that you understand the frame of mind that you get into before you actually begin a proof. This question, or this pair of questions, comes in an exercise that's all about proof by contradiction. So that's the technique that we're going to use in a minute. However, this nothing in the question itself actually tells you that a proof by contradiction is the way to go. And one of the primary skills that mathematicians need to develop and employ all the time is that they sort of develop like a toolbox, all these different strategies and techniques and approaches. And one of the most important skills they have is to choose between all of the different approaches uh, based on which one is most efficient or which one is most elegant or appropriate to the task. Now, in some topics, that's very, very obvious. Uh, we were looking at complex numbers recently, and if you get a question that's about complex numbers and it asks something to do with angles, then you're probably going to want to get your complex number out of rectangular form and potentially into mod arg form or even exponential form because that makes much clearer what angles you're operating with within the question. But when you're having a look at the topic, the nature of proof, we've seen all kinds of different techniques. We've looked at uh, the direct proofs, we've looked at proof by contradiction, proof by the contrapositive. Uh, how do you know which one is most appropriate? Now, I'm going to give you some suggestions by having a read of this question as to why you might think, even if it wasn't in an exercise about proof by contradiction, why there are actually clues in here that would lead you to think proof by contradiction is the way to go. So let's have a look at the question and get started. Question 13, part A, prove that the square root of 6 is irrational. So, right there is our first major clue. In fact, it's kind of the only clue that you need. Because we're trying to prove that, in the first instance, this square root of 6 number is irrational, I want you to think about what the word irrational means. Um, it literally is about the fact that you cannot, that's what the IR at the, st at the start stands for, you cannot express a number as a ratio, or we would more colloquially say as a fraction. So, I mean, it's kind of an established result that surds like this, where um, the number underneath the square root sign is, um, it's not a square number, so of course you're going to get something irrational. But how do we actually prove that to be the case? Now, it's tricky to go about this directly, and this is me getting at why you might think, why mathematicians would conclude, let's have a go at doing this by contradiction. To say that a number is irrational is to say that that number does not have some certain qualities about it. It, it. it does not have some characteristics. In this case, that it can be expressed as a ratio. Now, it's quite hard to deal with something when you're just saying things that it doesn't do. It's, it's like trying to define something and you, you know the things that it's not. If I asked you, or if you asked me, what's your favorite food? And I just told you all the foods that I dislike. You're like, well, I mean, that's all true, but you're not getting me any closer to working out what meal we should have. I'm just knowing the meals to avoid. So the reason why a proof by contradiction here is helpful is because because the basic building block in a proof by contradiction is not the statement that you're trying to prove, it's the negation of that statement. If the statement you're trying to prove is a, is a, you know, here's something I can't do, or here's some quality I don't have, then the negation of that would be, uh, this number does have some quality or some attribute or some characteristic. And if you assume that, you can then, you know, perhaps write some equations or apply some symbols to that, and then you can do some work on it. Of course, because um, we're working with the negation, we will eventually lead to something untrue, something absurd, and that's why this is going to be our goal. So let's have a go at this. It is somewhat a, a classic proof, um, but I wanted you to know why we were going about the proof and, and not just that you can do it. So let, let's have a go at part A. To do this by contradiction, as I just uh, alluded to, I need to know what the negation of this statement is and then we'll assume that to be true. Uh, it's a relatively simple statement that they're giving us here that root 6 is irrational. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the opposite is true, that root 6 is rational. Now, what this immediately allows us to do is make a statement about the square root of 6 and then start to apply logic and like algebraic manipulation to it and that kind of thing. And we're going to lead to our contradiction. So we're assuming that the square root of 6 is rational, which means that uh, I can say, therefore, the square root of 6 is equal to a ratio of two integers. So I'm just going to give them names. I'm going to call them P and Q. And I do need to say where P and Q are integers, because I'm dealing with the square root of 6, the square root function in the real number world is only defined for positive numbers, so therefore I can, I can restrict and say I, I want these both to be positive in order for the fraction to um, give me the square root of 6. 
Now this is a good start, but that's not the only thing that I need to be able to say. Um, if P and Q share some factors, then things are going to cancel and I'm not going to get a ratio anymore. So I actually need to apply an additional restriction on P and Q, not just that they are positive integers, but that they share no factors. So I'm just going to write that P and Q share no factors. So no cancelling can happen on this. Um, I will also mention, um, just while I'm here, we do have, because this idea of numbers not sharing factors, like say um, 10 and uh, what's a good example that I could give you? Should have thought of one off the top of my head. It's gonna have to be an odd number because 10 is even. Uh, 10 and say 21. 10 and 21, they share no factors. Um, we would say, because that, that idea of sharing no factors is an important mathematical concept, we give that its own uh, label. We call that co-prime. Uh, neither 10 nor 21 are prime numbers, they're both composite, but they're co-prime, when you consider them together, they don't share any factors. 10 only has two and five, uh, 21 only has three and seven. We're not worrying about one because it's a trivial case. I really should say share no prime factors, uh, but you get the idea. I, I just wanna avoid canceling being able to happen. All right, now, where do I go from here? Remember, where I'm trying to head is I'm trying to work with this thing um, in order to lead to a contradiction. That's part of what's a bit weird. We're used to getting equations and you just solve them, like find the pronumeral, isolate it, do whatever you need to. Um, but here, I'm trying to uh, lead to something that isn't true. So what can I do with this? First thing I'm going to say is uh, I want to get as quickly as I can away from this square root of six. It's very hard to work with, right? Um, I'm dealing with these, these integers over here and, and root six just is not coming to the party. So what could I do to this equation to eliminate this pesky uh, third um, and enable it to interact with the rest of the numbers that I have here? Uh, and you're probably thinking about it already. Square root of six, to get rid of the square root part of it, I'm going to square. So let's square both sides. That gives me six and it gives me uh, p squared on q squared on the right hand side. Now uh, that's slightly better, <laughs> now everything at least is in uh, integer world, um, but I've got, I've got whole numbers, but I'm still, I'm still not quite there yet. I, I need to get to a contradiction of some kind, and remember, um, you know, there are all of these, these things that I've said about p and q, potentially if I could get to the point where p and q I show that they can't possibly be whole numbers, that would be a contradiction, so that would be great. Or p and q, if I could show that they shared factors, that would also be a contradiction. Um, and there's a whole suite of other things that I could um, try and work toward. So in order to talk about one of these, um, let's think about this sharing factors business, right? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply both sides by uh, this q squared term over here, right? Because that's gonna help me get to a factorization that uh, is, is useful to me. So I'm gonna write um, not just six Q squared, but I'm actually gonna write two times three Q squared. So you'll see why in a second I've taken this six and I've just written it as two times three. Having multiplied both sides by Q squared, that just leaves me with P squared on the right hand side. Now, think carefully with me, what does this imply? Um, this tells me that p squared, because it is um, two times some other integer, um, I know if q is an integer, then q squared will be an integer, and three q squared will also be an integer. p squared is double some integer. Well, if you're double an integer, what that tells you is that you're even. I mean, that's what even means, right? So I can say this line here, this implies that p squared is even. Okay. So far, so good. Um, what can I do with that though? How, how can I lead from this to a contradiction? Well, this means that I can actually make some statements about p, what kind of number p is. If p squared is even, I actually know something already about p itself. Uh, maybe the, the gears are turning. We've actually done this proof uh, within earlier exercises, uh, not looking at proof by contradiction. Think about this, right? I'm actually gonna go about this using another tool that we've got, the, um, the contrapositive, right? What I'm gonna say is, if you have um, P being odd, uh, think of any odd number you like, uh, three, seven, nine, five, I don't know why I skipped five, and so on and so on. What you can say is, in fact, I don't even need to put that if there, um, I can say, but if P is odd, that implies that P squared is odd. Square of three is nine, that's odd. Uh, square of five is 25, that's odd. And, and you can prove that algebraically, of course. Um, let's just do that right now. Uh, if I said that P was equal to some 
2k plus 1, uh, where k was an integer, figure out what happens when you square that, right? Um, what that tells you is that p squared is going to be, let's just take the binomial and expand it, 2k plus 1 all squared will be uh, 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. There's the a squared 2ab plus b squared. Now you can see here, this component here clearly is even. It's like super even, not just multiply by 2, you multiply by 2 twice. Um, and then you add 1 to that. So an even number plus 1, it's odd. So if you start with an odd number, then when you square it, you also have an odd number. But that means I can take this tool, the contrapositive, I can say by the contrapositive, what is a contrapositive? Well, you negate both parts of an implication and you reverse the order. Um, if we said that this is P implies Q, then what I'm going to say is not Q implies not P. Uh, that was a bit confusing because I'm using the, the pronumeral P here, but uh, let me write it and you can see if uh, it makes sense to you. The negation of this is P squared is even. By the contrary, positive, P squared is even. That will imply the negation of the first part, you can see I've switched around the order of um, the antecedent and the consequent part of this implication. So P is even as well. And if you just think about some examples of this, that's obviously true. So what I can say is, um, going back to you know, what does this mean? I can say, therefore, um, there exists some value of N that's uh, an integer, and I'm going to restrict it to positive because p itself is also positive. There exists some value of N within the positive integers such that p equals 2n. That's the point of saying that it's even. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this new way of writing p and substitute it back into, I suppose I should give this a name, let's call this equation up here, let's call it equation 1 so that I can name it. I can say substitute that uh, p equals 2n, let's substitute that into 1. Okay, what do we get? So I'm going to write this as uh, 2 times 3q squared equals uh, 2p, 2n rather, not 2p, I just substituted out p, 2n all squared. So you can see here, this is going to become 4n squared over here, right? Which uh, if I simplify that out, for n squared, you can see there's going to be some cancelling happen between this factor, uh, this has a factor of 2, and of course there's a 2 sitting right there. So what does that give us? 3q squared equals 2n squared. But hold up, this now tells us that 3q squared, this number on the left hand side, just like my earlier argument about why p squared had to be even, because it was double an integer, well now I can say that 3q squared is also even, because it's double an integer. So uh, this implies, this line here implies that 3q squared is even. Now even means that there's a factor of 2, but you're not going to get that from the 3. 3 itself is prime and it's not going to contribute evenness to my 3q squared. So if 3q squared is even, that means q squared must be even. But as we saw above by using the contrapositive, q squared being even means that q is also even. So write that implication, Q is even. So where has this led us? And the answer is we are at a contradiction. Um, we have P and Q both being even. I can say, um, well therefore, P and Q are both even. And that implies, or I mean it's even the definition, that P and Q share a factor of two. And this is the contradiction. So you can see I've landed on a fact uh, that sort of, well, it, it sort of flies in the face of the way we started this, that P and Q are positive integers that share no factors, that are co-prime. Well, I've just shown you just take that assumption and you end up with the fact that, in fact, they are not uh, co-prime, they share a factor. So contradiction, square root of 6 can't possibly be rational, which was what my assumption was. Therefore, uh, square root of 6 is irrational. Done.
Okay, take a breath. How do we use this? Because you can see this is just a part A of uh, two parts. How do we use this to do the next part of the question? Hence, prove that root three plus root two is irrational. Now, obviously I could go about this, I could kind of rehearse this entire thing for the square root of three and for the square root of two, and then say, oh, look, I have two irrational numbers. Does, does that help us, right? Well, there are actually some sneaky reasons why that's not, uh, that's not gonna be useful. Um, but also we have been told, look, you got to use that logic that you just proved. And this is the best way to prove that, uh, or it is a very elegant way, I should say. Difficult to say best. I don't know every other proof out there in the universe. Um, this is a very efficient way to prove um, that root three plus root two is rational if I use this root six being irrational. So I'm going to do it in a similar kind of, uh, using a similar structure. Uh, because proving something is irrational is tricky, I'm going to assume that it's rational and then see what happens from there. So another proof by contradiction on the way. Part B. Let's assume that the square root of 3 plus the square root of 2, uh, let's assume that that uh, whole thing when you combine it together, it is rational. So it belongs to the set of rational numbers. That's the way I can write that. If that is true, um, you know, when you square a rational number, you should get another rational number out. Uh, because, you know, if you, if you had, um, you know, five over seven is a rational number. Uh, when you square that, five squared on seven squared, well, no big deal. Uh, the numerator is still a uh, uh, a whole number, an integer, denominator is still an integer, um, so you're good to go, right? So therefore, I'm going to consider, and maybe this is where you're thinking, oh, this is the connection to part A. I'm going to consider, um, I shouldn't write it therefore, I'm going to say consider uh, what happens when we square this thing, right? Wow, that's a really messy two. Let's try that again. All right, uh, this is just a classic binomial expansion. We've already done one earlier today, but let's go through it uh, slowly together. A plus B all squared is A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. So what's A squared in this case? It's the square root of 3 squared. So that just gives me 3. Um, I then do the 2AB. So that's double square root of 3, square root of 2. And then I've got my B squared along the end, which is 2. So now I've got gathering, uh, collecting like terms. I've got the 3 and the 2 giving me 5. Then I've got a 2 here. And by combining the square root of 3 and the square root of 2, that product, of course, is the square root of 6. Aha, now we see the connection to that whole reason why we proved square root of six is irrational. I can say, but the square root of six, um, it belongs to the irrational numbers. Um, you might remember um, we have this tilde. The tilde, gee, it does some heavy lifting. Um, it means a lot of things. It means approximately. Uh, if you put it underneath, it means vectors. In this context, it means you're, you're in the complement. Um, you know, we've seen this also with, uh, with logic. You can use this uh, tilde as a negation. Square root of six is in the set of irrational numbers. And therefore, uh, oopsie daisy. Therefore, uh, this square here, duplicate that. Uh, that is, it can't possibly uh, be in the set of rational numbers because it's got this irrational number tucked away in it. Uh, that is going to be a contradiction, right? Um, we can say, well, if the square isn't a rational number, then the number you started from can't possibly be rational either. So I can say this is a contradiction. And therefore, uh, the square root of three plus the square root of two is irrational. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, the lessons that I take out of this are number one, uh, think carefully about uh, why it is that you would choose one method of proof versus another. Think about what's easiest uh, or most convenient to you. Uh, and then secondly, you know, when you're thinking about how to uh, you know, do some of these hence questions, uh, these kinds of things are, are going to lead from this. You, you want to think about how you can get from the particular result you need to prove uh, from this connected result. So where does root six um, appear in square root of three and square root of two, and it's, it's the product between them, so that's why squaring was the natural thing to do.